The calculation of the posterior mean can also be expressed on a slightly different form. To see this, we need to look at how the mean of the different components in the mixture are computed. To simplify the equations, we introduce the variable z bar k given k minus 1 as the predicted measurement. For theta k equals 0, which is the hypothesis that the object is undetected, the posterior mean is identical to the predicted mean. For the hypothesis where theta k is greater than 0, the posterior mean is given by a common filter update using the measurement z theta k k. We can now plug this into the expression for the posterior mean, which is this summation over theta k from 0 to mk. As you can see, the predicted mean x bar PDA at k given k minus 1 appears in all hypotheses, whereas the Kalman gain times the innovation only appears for positive values of theta k. The summation can therefore be separated into one sum over all theta k, which contains the predicted mean, and one summation over positive theta k, which contains the Kalman gain and the innovation. Interestingly, the first term simplifies to just the predicted mean, since the weights sum to 1, whereas the Kalman gain can be factored out from the second summation. What is left inside the summation can then be thought of as an expected value of the innovation, where we have to think of the innovation as zero under the hypothesis that the object is undetected. Note that this looks like a standard Kalman filter update, where the innovation has been replaced by this expected innovation. And computing the posterior mean like this gives you a slightly faster implementation. To visualize the PDA filter in action, we can see how it compares with the nearest neighbor filter in the two examples that we looked at in the earlier videos. To do this, we will visualize five different densities at every time step. These densities are the predicted density according to the PDA filter, illustrated using a red point dashed curve, the exact posterior without any approximations, which is the solid black curve, the density P breathe, which is the Gaussian mixture that we obtain if we perform an update step using the predicted density. P breathe is a dashed magenta colored curve which is identical to the black curve at time 1. Finally, we have the posterior according to the PDA filter, which is a blue curve marked with triangles, and the posterior according to the nearest neighbor filter, which is the green curve marked with squares. Like before, the MK measurements are illustrated using blue stars on the x-axis. At time 1, you can see that P breathe is bimodal. The PDA approximation to the posterior therefore has a much larger variance than the nearest neighbor approximation to the posterior. Neither of the filters approximate the posterior density particularly well. Note that P breathe is bimodal since both the measurement at 1.7 and minus 1.3 are reasonable object measurements. Given the measurement at time 2, it is much more unlikely that the measurement at minus 1.3 was an object measurement. And the nearest neighbor algorithm is actually quite an accurate approximation to the posterior whereas the PDA filter overestimates the uncertainties slightly. At time 3, P breathe is again bimodal, and the uncertainties according to the PDA filter are much larger than according to the nearest neighbor filter. At time 4, we have a similar situation. However, as we continue to collect measurements between 2 and 3, both the PDA filter and the nearest neighbor filter agree that the object state is in that region. At time 6, there are both fairly good approximations to the true posterior. One observation from this scenario is that the PDA filter tends to yield larger posterior uncertainties than the nearest neighbor filter. Let us proceed to consider the second example where the nearest neighbor algorithm performed more poorly. The first three time steps are identical to the first scenario. At time 3, the nearest neighbor algorithm has underestimated the uncertainties whereas the PDA posterior is slightly more accurate. At time 4, the true posterior is bimodal, stating that the object state is likely to be either a small negative number or a number close to 3. The nearest neighbor algorithm confidently states that the object is around 3, whereas the PDA filter approximates the posterior using a Gaussian density with a large variance. As we collect more measurements, the true posterior indicates that the object state is around minus 1. Even though the PDA algorithm overestimates the posterior uncertainties, it makes use of the new measurements to shift the posterior in the right direction. At time 6, the PDA filter approximates the posterior density relatively well, 
whereas the nearest neighbor algorithm has disregarded the last two measurements as clutter and still believes that the object state is around three. So, at least in this scenario, the PDA performs better than the nearest neighbor algorithm and managed to keep track of the object fairly well. To summarize, the idea behind PDA is to merge all hypotheses and approximate the Gaussian mixture P-Breve as a Gaussian density with the same mean and covariance as P-Breve. The PDA filter is a fast algorithm which is easy to implement, it works well in simple scenarios, and it does not underestimate the uncertainties to the same extent as the nearest neighbor algorithm. A consequence of this is that it sometimes manages to keep track of the object in situations when the nearest neighbor doesn't. Still, the posterior density is often far from Gaussian, and the PDA approximation will then yield poor performance compared to using the true posterior.